thank you for uh, coming today. If you can please just uh, tell us who you are and who you're with. And uh, for the panel, we ask that you keep your comments for three minutes, and then there may be questions for the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative. My name is Dr. Denise Sibley. I'm an internal medicine board certified physician from Johnson City. I've treated over 4,400 patients for COVID over the last 23 months. I've done so without any financial benefit, and I come here without any financial conflicts of interest or any conflicts of interest. I work for myself. Um, this is something I'm very passionate about as someone who's actually COVID recovered myself. As you can see, I, I call myself a walking comorbidity and I'm here alive uh, because of treatment. Um, so I've treated many, many different pa patients um, who have recovered, including an HIV positive patient, a organ transplant patient, a 99 year old, a 500 pound person, and my elderly parents who are 88, 90. So I've treated a wide variety of patients. And the, the idea that immunity uh, that you acquire from a disease has been a centuries old uh, part of medicine. This was even recognized before germ theory. Back in the 1300s when the Black Plague came through, uh, they were the people that had recovered from the Black Plague were allowed to carry out the bottle, bodies of those who had recently passed away. So they even recognized back then that once you had the disease, you were immune. Suddenly, um, in, in this COVID era, that changed so that the definition of um, immunity was changed to only include a vaccination. Um, I will also say that for myself and other people who are COVID recovered, to mandate a vaccine is to uh, experience adverse, increased adverse events. That is, if I was required to get a vaccine, I would have a two to four times chance of increasing my risk of an adverse event. And I will uh, introduce you to my friend, Nikki, who did not have COVID, but she did experience an adverse event from a, a vaccine in her primary series. And um, I would be experiencing two to four times that risk. Um, this is real and um, this happens, I have uh, over 500 vaccine injured patients in my cohort. Um, so this is something I'm very passionate about. Um, and as a healthcare worker, I think that um, natural immunity should be recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you have another, is that the end of the panel comments or if I've got the mic working. My name is Dr. Robert Malone. I'm a Maryland licensed physician. I'm also a scientist. I'm here representing the International Association of Physicians and Medical Scientists, which is over 17,000 physicians and scientists. I serve as the president. I also serve as the chief medical and regulatory officer for the Unity Project based out of California. We're an association of many, many other organizations that are opposed to vaccine mandates, particularly for children. I also happen to be the person who originally invented the mRNA vaccine technology between 1987 and 1989. I support that assertion by the basis of nine issued U.S. domestic patents and many international patents. I have over 30 years of experience as a vaccine developer. I work closely with the federal government, particularly the Department of Defense, but often sit on study sections or chair study sections for the NIH and NIAID. I'm particularly noted as an expert in biodefense and have uh, either won or managed over $8 billion in federal grants and contracts. I'm here uh, to speak to this issue of natural immunity and I'd like to mention just four key points. First off, um, regarding natural immunity and vaccine-induced immunity. As someone who is a specialist in the technology and in vaccines, one of the issues that we have with the vaccines that are currently used here in the United States for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is they produce a very narrow immune response that unfortunately seems to wane as measured by effectiveness. 
in the field, and you know this because of the repeated uh, requirements for vaccine boosters. It's narrow because it's only against the spike antigen, and there are many different antigens or proteins expressed by the virus. When one elicits natural immunity as a consequence, or one, perhaps I prefer the term uh, acquired immunity, after infection, what you elicit is a mucosal immune response because that's how you experience the virus as opposed to the parenteral immune response that's generated from the vaccine. And the immune response is broad-based. It's against multiple different proteins. And so it provides much more robust immunity as measured in the field. And Dr. Cole will speak to this. Um, the second I point I wish to make is, as somebody who's been traveling quite a bit throughout this outbreak, I'm very familiar with the policies in the European Union in which uh, acquired or natural immunity is widely recognized in the European Union green card system as equivalent in providing protection for all of the various requirements for access to state buildings, restaurants, etc. Although it's of interest that in the European Union, except for Italy, all of those uh, passport requirements are being dropped about the middle of this month. Uh, third part, uh, natural immunity versus acquired or recovered. I just wanted to mention those terms are somewhat, they're interchangeable. It's the common language that's developed this idea of natural immunity, but more precisely, it's really the uh, acquired immunity as opposed to the term we usually use as innate immune response. That's the immunity that your body naturally has even if they haven't experienced the virus before. So technically, I, I prefer acquired immunity rather than natural immunity, but that's a small um, tick. Uh, we are aware, unfortunately, that with uh, the vaccines, the antibody response wanes. Uh, you're over your three I, I apologize. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we, we can get to you in the questions. Uh, we have one more uh, person to testify. Uh, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Dr. Ryan Cole. I'm an MD. I'm a physician. Uh, Mayo Clinic trained anatomic medical pathology, subspecialty fellowship in dermatopathology. I do molecular biology. I've done over 150,000 COVID tests in my laboratory. Uh, much to my chagrin, there's a member of the General Assembly that sent out a false email defamatory libelous slanderous about me. Hopefully you will all get a copy of my CV. On the bill, please. All right, thank you. Just so you know, I am who I am. Um, <clears throat> natural immunity to uh, both Dr. Sibley and Dr. Malone's um, point is that we have always recognized it in medicine until these last two years. Just in the last week, uh, Dr. Walensky of the CDC has finally started uh, soft meddling and saying, hey, yeah, natural immunity, COVID acquired immunity is real. That was in a grand rally she gave at <clears throat> Washington University, St. Louis last week. Um, we know that a vac vaccine immunity does not equal um, a COVID recovered immunity to the point that uh, Dr. Malone just brought out and that there are many proteins on the virus that a vaccine only covers one. Uh, COVID recovered uh, acquired immunity covers all of those. We know SARS-CoV-1 for 18 years and running now, those individuals who had SARS-CoV-1 are still immune to SARS-CoV-1 and interestingly cross immune to SARS-CoV-2 as well. So people worry about is this long durable? Absolutely. Uh, an acquired uh, natural immunity is long and durable. <clears throat> Studies from those individuals who had uh, COVID early in the pandemic in, in Italy, Northern Italy still have immunity. And based on our studies with SARS-CoV-1, that should extend on out um, in perpetuity for what we know at this point. Um, interestingly, you know, if you get a shot, you don't make the little antibody mops in your tears, your nose, your throat, like you do in a natural infection where the virus enters. So those who've had a natural infection have the ability to clear the virus. Those who've had the vaccine uh, don't have the ability because they don't have these little IgA secretory mops in their tears, nose, and throat. And that's why we've seen a lot of those who've gotten one, two, three shots still get COVID because they don't develop a full broad immunity like a natural infection does. So that's a very important just uh, pathophysiological um, factoid. So basically, um, your chance of getting uh, COVID and spreading COVID according to CDC in their data, when they were inquired how many people have been shown to have COVID and spread it to anyone else, their answer was they couldn't show one single case. And that was a case by ICANN and uh, attorney Aaron Siri. So those are just my brief introductory comments, and I'm uh, pleased to answer any questions thereafter. Thank you.
Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, we have some uh, members here that may have some questions. Uh, I will ask the first question, and it's to Dr. Malone. Uh, you ran out of time. I'd like to hear your report point. Okay. First, I have to turn on the microphone. Uh, the point has to do with the durability, which is a key issue. And we know that the waning immunity has been a major problem with the vaccines, no matter how many boosters you receive. And as Dr. Cole has just testified, the data are very clear that the uh, acquired adaptive immunity lasts uh, considerably longer than the 60 days associated with the vaccine acquired immunity. I'd also like to emphasize that one needs to be cautious. There is no evidence that neutralizing antibodies or antibody titers are actually an accurate predictor of protection. That seems to be a misunderstanding among many folks. The only measure that we have right now in a regulatory standpoint, and that's one of my core competencies, is actual measured immunity in the terms of the patient not being susceptible to infection. So at this point in time, the fact that antibodies may wane with one of the other vaccine or acquired immunity is essentially moot because it is not predictive of protection. Historically, with uh, respiratory viruses, the protection is afforded by T cells, not antibodies. Over. All right, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, Leader Gant, your right. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm not sure who wants to take this question. I've got a few questions. Allow me to, Chairman. Sure. Is it your professional opinion that the acquired natural immunity is, is it more effective than the vaccines that are on the market now? And if, if so, why? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for that question. Yes, if we look at the studies out of Israel and out of Qatar, uh, they clearly indicate that a COVID recovered immunity is much stronger than a vaccinal immunity. And the early Israel studies, and this was on hundreds of thousands of patients, it was about 13 times stronger to have a COVID recovered immunity. And the Qatar study was all, uh, approaching 30 times stronger. So we have the data from many studies around the world with good data sets showing that those who have recovered from COVID have a much better, longer, broader, durable immunity. How long does the vaccine, is there any science or studies that show how long the vaccine lasts versus natural acquired immunity? Well, that's the challenge with these vaccines. We've seen a number of uh, cases acquired in those who've gotten a shot and still gotten COVID. So um, early on, it was thought that they would be long lasting. We found on average, it was only a few months and then waning at that. <clears throat> and with Omicron, we've seen that those who have um, had a shot or had a booster actually have a higher chance of acquiring Omicron than those who, who didn't. So we've seen the data out of Denmark, out of Israel, out of the UK, where the shots actually turn into what we call negative efficacy, <laughs> where your chances are higher from the shots of getting disease instead of being protective. So if, if I could, if I could augment that, sir, in the latest data from Albany Board of Health, that's uh, received quite a bit of press attention. We see evidence of the pediatric population of lack of protection for as, little, as short a period as 30 days. So very short uh, duration, we call it durability of protection associated with the vaccines in key pediatric populations, over. You're right. Are there any additional benefits of natural immunity versus vaccine long-term? Uh, thank you, and that's a great question, and, and I think that goes back to the SARS-CoV-1 question, and those individuals, if you have a natural infection, you make antibodies in T-cell memory broadly to all parts of the virus. Now, when you get a shot, you're only getting about 12% of the virus, the half of the virus, the, your, your head, but in a natural infection in all diseases, when you see the whole organism, now you have a broad... Uh, brush painted picture of that organism and your body says well if I can't attack this part I can attack that or that or that not only do you have those neutralizing antibodies but you also have the Marines of your immune system they're the first ones in to recognize an invader and they also form memory and they attack that whole virus as well but when you focus on one little area like the spike and it mutates now if you have just that vaccinal immunity you're going to lose that breadth of coverage 
but you have a big, broad, strong marine fighting force if you've had the natural infection because your body recognizes all those proteins in the entire virus, even if part of it changes. Sir, I know you have been fed. Um, it, it was, we, we use this terminology, mucosal immune response, and it may not mean much to the lay person. What the language means is that your immune system is targeted and it has different characteristics depending on where you first encounter the antigen, the virus. And this term mucosal immunity, what it means is there are particular types of antibodies, Brian referred to them as secretory IgA, that are produced in the lining of your mucosa, like your nose and your oral pharynx. And that's where you get infected with these retro respiratory viruses first. And so the answer, the specific answer to your question, in addition to what Dr. Cole just mentioned, is there's this specific category of antibody that's produced with natural infection that is not produced with the parenteral infection of muscle shot. And that is key to clearing the virus and preventing you from being infected by the normal route of your nose and your mouth or your eyes is a frequent uh, source. I hope that makes sense, sir. And if I could put you back on real quick, in studies in Wisconsin, Vietnam, and California showed that, that those who have gotten a shot in the arm don't make these critical necessary mucosal antibodies. And hence, those individuals in those studies that had gotten the shot were carrying equal or higher volumes of all the uh, virus than those who had not. Very good. Chairman's my last question. I promise. Help me understand the, the vaccines that were developed. They were developed under emergency orders, correct? So they did not go through the normal testing and trials that take years. Can you explain that so we can, the committee can have a better understanding of that process? Thank you, sir. I'll field this question. I am a specialist uh, both in biodefense, in federal rules and regulations, and regulatory affairs. I've been doing this for well over 20 years. I'm a recognized expert in this area, particularly in emergency use authorization language. What we have is a situation in which, under the understandable fog of war and the need to expedite some immediate response, a series of decisions were made in the White House and in the uh, task force known as Operation War. I actually uh, had mentored the um, now colonel who was in charge of OWS for Moderna. So I'm very aware of what will happen. And it certainly, um, although the government has asserted that no, uh, there were no um, uh, steps uh, of taken that normally would be taken, that, that is not true. As you correctly identify, typically it takes us 10 years and well over a billion dollars to take a vaccine to licensure, and it typically requires at least two years after completion of the phase three trials. In the case of this particular situation, uh, there was a decision by the FDA to allow the uh, vaccine manufacturers to bypass a number of the normal steps that would be required before the product would ever be used in humans and to uh, minimize the characterization that would be normally performed. A number of these steps include uh, characterization of genotoxicity, um, biodistribution, uh, what we call pharmacokinetics. So this is how long the material lasts inside your body and the levels of protein and the levels of the drug that are, that are sustained in various tissue compartments and where it goes. <coughs> This information have now gradually trickled out, and most recently, there was a major publication in the journal called Cell by a group from Stanford, so impeccable credentials, that demonstrated that although the pharmaceutical company asserted that these RNAs only last for a very short period of time in your body, in humans, it was clearly demonstrated through fine needle aspiration that these RNAs last in the body for at least 60 days. So there's a number of steps that were not taken which are normally required. And it's understandable, I don't fault my colleagues for wanting to rush something out the door, but now it's two years later, essentially. And we do know that a number of those steps were bypassed and they were now starting to understand 
now that Pfizer has been forced judicially to release the nine pages of adverse events associated with these vaccines that um, we're dealing with a much more complex landscape of adverse events than any of us had anticipated, unfortunately. I hope that answers your question, sir. It does. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all for being here. All right. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Vaughn, you're right now. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to talk to you all a few months ago. <laughs> Very much. Uh, <laughs> you bet. The, uh, I was someone who, who early on, called early on, COVID uh, first go around. I uh, actually missed some time here. And my doctor and I decided that we were gonna try to do a measured immunity uh, testing of antibodies to see if and when they waned and if and when he was gonna suggest that I, I take a vaccine before I'm around a lot more people. <coughs> and it seems as if they had a number, he had a number in mind, and I'm not an epidemiologist nor uh, I'm just a patient that follows my doctor's advice. And it's, at some point, about six months into it, he said, hey, your antibodies have waned to the point where he said, you need to start thinking about getting, uh, at least taking one of the vaccines. And the premise of this bill is, is that you can basically get documented that, you, that you, you've had COVID, but with a quantitative waning of antibodies, how is, is the science available that we can feel good about the fact. And again, I don't know why we're gonna to have to present something. I mean, I, I think it's, that's a whole different set of questions. But can you, is the measurable diminishment of antibodies a concern and does that actually affect your immunity? Or do the T cells that come in that you can't measure, is that what's gonna kick? Because I saw, I was getting blood test results back and I was watching numbers drop. And, and now what those numbers were, I had to assume that he knew what they were. But that, but that's my question. And I'm sorry for the, the jibber jabbering around that I'm trying to communicate and stuff that I'm not that more about. No, thank you, that's an excellent question. And, and this is a common question. And my, an, my answer is generally antibody schmantibodies. Because your antibodies always go down in any infection. If we kept an antibody response level to all the pathogens we're exposed to every day, our blood would sludge. So it would be non-viable for life. So your antibodies level, the levels do go down, but what's important is we have memory cells both in our lymph nodes and in our bone marrow, both B cells that make those antibodies, those memory still, cells still exist. And then more importantly, those T cells, which you can measure a subset of T cells that has been activated to SARS-CoV-2. So there is a test that measures for uh, activation specific to SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's a little more expensive test, unfortunately, but it is documentable. The most important thing, and I think, and Dr. Kumar brought this up, is if you've had an infection, you had, you know, you were ill, you had a positive test, your doctor has validated that. In the history of medicine, generally, if you've had a disease and your doctor says, look, you've had that disease, I mean, that's documentation enough, in my opinion, because it does become kind of a rabbit hole of, well, how do we prove this, how do you do that? There are some good lab tests, there are others that are not so accurate. It's a great question. But the clinical data is really, I think, what's most telling. And if you look at the clinical outcomes in individuals that are COVID recovered, and, and or you know a handful do get reinfected even if they had COVID, more seem to be get, getting reinfected if they had the shot and not had COVID, they'll get, they'll get reinfected after the shot. But the clinical outcomes, especially if you look at that large study out of Qatar, there were no adverse outcomes in the handful of people that got COVID again after being COVID recovered. Whereas in the vaccinated group, there were a lot more ICU admissions and, and demises. So looking at the broad clinical outcome in recovery of disease is one of the best societal measures of, of acquired immunity. Thank you, and, and this is just the one follow-up. Um, my wife, uh, was tested and, and uh, determined to, to have antibodies, yet she never presented a symptom. And so from that standpoint, uh, again, her doctor, my physician said, hey, yeah, you've had it, uh, you, you've got a period of time here, you can go do whatever you, you know, uh, is responsible. But for those people who don't present, is there some, are y'all against them going to get tested? I, I, I'm trying to figure that out because there's a lot of folks walking around that think they're the luckiest people in the world because they've never had it, never caught it. 
but yet they may have had it and, and have never presented. So that's my question is, is how, what program or should the general society, what's your recommendation for just general society with regards to considering the fact that not every, every time somebody has this disease, they pre present with symptoms? That's a great question. And a lot of people never do present a symptom. And if we look at some antibody studies, take for example, children in the UK, as of January, 96% of kids through those studies had been shown to already have COVID. Now we can assume based on, now the CDC's data is way behind, but we know hundreds of millions of Americans have had COVID. They said 140 million last week. It's far higher than that likely to your point of you know, asymptomatic individuals. And this was just laboratory data, you know, aggregated from around the country. So great question. There's a, a set percentage of people that will never get COVID. And here's why, because we have common cold coronaviruses that are 60% similar to this virus. And so you will go into that broad natural immunity because they formed some antibody memory to these other common cold viruses may never get COVID at all. Now is COVID with us still? Will it be endemic? Yes. Are we back down to pre-December levels of infection? We are. So we have this giant Omicron spike, you know, we're back down to take a breath. We don't have a medical emergency anymore per se. If you want to get tested, the antibody testing is easy. The T cell testing is more expensive. If you already had COVID, don't worry about it. But if you have that question, yeah, there are laboratories that can do it and those are many. Can I have one comment to this? Um, the underlying thesis of a lot of this discussion is that this is a highly lethal pathogen. But in the current embodiment, whether or not the original strain was, and like you, I was infected in February of 2020 with the original Wuhan strain, and it affected me deeply. Um, Omicron, as I predicted before Christmas, is acting as a natural vaccine. It's eliciting the mucosal immune response. It's extremely infectious. It swept through the entire population, but fortunately, it's not very pathogenic. Now, it's possible that could change. That's the truth. But right now, what we're dealing with is not a highly lethal pathogen. And we've had a lot of fear that we've all been subjected to over the last two years, unfortunately. But we're now in a situation where the currently circulating virus is not highly pathogenic. And so, and furthermore, the vaccines are not protecting against infection, replication, and spread. So I think that this, I can certainly understand the fear that all of us have and have experienced and your constituents have experienced. But fortunately or unfortunately, that fear is unfounded at this point in time with this virus and particularly for your children. They clear this really rapidly for a number of reasons. And so I think a lot of this underlying assumption that we have to be super sensitive about this particular pathogen is unfounded. This is not the, this is not Delta. This is not the original strain. What's circulating right now is not a highly pathogenic respiratory virus because the virus has shifted where it's infecting. Um, you'll recall if I can just give you one last thing to kind of help you process. Remember H1N1? I do. H1N1 kind of came in two flavors. There's a version of H1N1 that infected your upper respiratory tract, and that was not highly lethal. There's a version that res infected your lower respiratory tract, got lodged in your lungs, and that killed people. That's always been the case. And the original strains that were circulating had that characteristic, they would infect your deep lung, and that's why it took so many of your friends and colleagues. But the Omicron and the ones that are developing off of Omicron have shifted for some reason, thank God. And they're now affecting this part of the airway and your nasopharynx, and they're not highly pathogenic. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Speaker Marks, you're right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all very much for being here. I'm not near an expert in this, but I would like to ask a hypothetical question. In fact, you're talking about fear and death and the early on. And you, I suppose, if you hadn't had the disease, you didn't have the natural immunity. So would you recommend that during that, that, that time frame that you did get a vaccine, or would you recommend that you had never got a vaccine? Sure. Okay, if I, if I catch that one. Um, 
when I was infected and when your colleague was infected, there was no vaccine, so we didn't have that option. When, when we did have a period of time when we had a highly lethal version of Delta and the availability of vaccine, the, the data demonstrated that for high-risk individuals, it was unequivocal, just as the Great Barrington Declaration authors had recommended, that it absolutely made sense as a risk-benefit ratio that people who are in those high-risk groups should be vaccinated against Delta. Now, we're no, Delta is gone. He was outcompeted by Omicron. Omicron is much more infectious. And like I said, it acts like a vaccine. And so we're no longer in that position then, but there was a period of time when people who were um, at high risk definitely had a beneficial risk-benefit ratio um, to receiving the vaccine. That time has passed now. Uh, I think it's a good thing. I hope that answers your question, sir. Thank you. Uh, next on our list, uh, Representative Mitchell, you're right back. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, from from that logic, what you just said, though, you know, we we've eliminated several diseases. So, by your logic, there. Should we just stop immunizing children uh, for a lot of the diseases uh, that we wiped off, almost wiped off the planet because, you know, we saw a resurgence of measles and smallpox recently because parents didn't immunize their children. So what do you suggest though? Well, well, sir, 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 like sir that? Um, you're right. Can you, can you tell me where we had a resurgence of smallpox? That's new news to me. Well, it was the, the I'm sorry, the measles in, in New York. Ah, I see. You're right. And to that question, that outbreak stayed within. If you if you look at these small outbreaks, they generally stay within that small cluster of that unvaccinated group. I think these have tended to be certain religious clusters and religious groups. But if you ask for the data to document any spread beyond those groups, you don't see it. But when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, now that we have Omicron here and the vaccines essentially don't prevent you from getting Omicron, this virus has intermediate hosts, meaning the virus can bounce back and forth between animals and humans and animals and humans. So unless you stick a shot in every bat and every pangolin and every deer, white-tailed deer like to house this virus in their nasal mucosa as well, there are too many animal reservoirs for this kind of virus. There are certain viruses that you're talking about that we've essentially been able to eliminate from humanity. We will never get to COVID zero because this virus has the opportunity to go back and forth between animals and humans. So this is a basic virology principle behind different families of viruses. And this is one of those viruses where we can never eradicate it for that very reason. And the director of the CDC has recently acknowledged that, that in the term that's used, it's again one of these sciencey terms is that this virus is now endemic and will continue to be so. You're right, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I might bring up that there's treatment. Uh, early treatment really works, and I've demonstrated that in my own over 4,000 patients. Uh, there are many protocols that we've used for over almost two years now. The early treatment is. Uh, a very, very good um, alternative, in fact, superior to vaccination. Thank you. Mitchell, you're right. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Shea. So, Dr. Cole, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't suggest the vaccine, even when the vaccine was available for the Delta, you, you didn't want to prescribe that. Did you prescribe anything else to your patients other than to get the vaccine for COVID-19? You know, I, in terms of the vaccine, no, I haven't recommended it to anyone because I am, I've never spoken against a vaccine in my life. So, you know, those who believe me anti-vax are incorrect. I'm pro good science. And in this regard, we had a new experimental gene shot with no long-term outcomes. By the time Delta hit, we were starting to see the efficacy of the shot wane and become negative. Same thing with Omicron. Um, in children who have a 0% risk, I would never recommend the shot for a child ever, just like Governor DeSantis did um, in terms of no healthy child to get the shot. So in retrospect, no. 
and you know a small benefit maybe in some of the elderly but now my concern is we're seeing those who got multiple shots are dying of uh, in in studies are dying of all cause mortality all other causes at higher rates in that vaccinated group so my my background concern is as an you know with a background in immunology pathology virology when I looked at the technology role rolling forth knew the history of SARS-CoV-1 and antibodies forever. You get a shot, you make an antibody forever. A, ter a therapy is temporary. You give somebody a therapy, which I did for many patients and helped them and lost not a single patient. That therapy goes away, that antibody doesn't. It's good at first, but it becomes your enemy down the road if it's the wrong antibody. So you're stating that you did not lose a single patient and, and you still didn't answer the question if you prescribed anything else. So uh, yes, are, are, do you want to restate that you did not lose a single patient? Yes, I will restate that. Okay. I did not lose a single patient. Uh, not a single patient was hospitalized. Not a single patient passed away. Yes, I used ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, budesonide, yeah. you know, fibrate. <laughs> 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 kitchen table and you told me that you had you know we're saving about a hundred people and to hear you say we've made it with four thousand five hundred in Johnson City that means the world to me I thank you for your fight for your diligence and you faced much adverse 